It was tucked behind this row of house trailers. You'd get there by parking at the dead end of a modest, nondescript little subdivision. From there, a few steps down the path that the locals kept mowed would bring you to a 1,000 foot stretch of some of the finest fly fishing in western New York. formed by an Army Corps of Engineers project that was meant to reduce bank erosion. An oxbow in the Genesee River made it eat its way into the outside bend, threatening Route 19 and all the homes along it. The newly dug channel split the river's flow, so the original water's path became a mere side channel, removing the threat to infrastructure. There is a happy consequence to dividing the river like that. See, the Genesee River has always been just this close to being a blue ribbon trout stream. There are about 30 miles of gravelly riffles and runs that get stocked with trout and have all kinds of different fly hatches. But trout are a cold water species and you can't always rely on the Genesee to run cold. In a hot, droughty year, most of these stocked fish won't survive until fall. We're told by the DEC that there's no natural reproduction in the Jenny. But every so often you'll get a cold, rainy summer. That lets the trout survive into the next year, where they live that much longer and get that much bigger. I've been around when we got two chilly, damp summers in a row. The kind of fishing we got after that was the kind around which you could form a religion. took my buddy, Jay, the fishing guide, to the Genesee during such a top-notch year. He released a fish, stared at the pool full of rolling backs of browns and rainbows still porpoising, and said, a guy would travel hundreds of miles to fish here. This made me a little uneasy. Their fishing spots in New York ruined by publicity, and I grew to be protective of my home river. Of course, by the dog days of that summer, the sun burned hot, the water level dropped, and that year's crop of trout went on to feed the herons, minks, and mergansers. Next spring we were back to normal, with mostly cookie cutter stalkers. The thing about Stevens Court was that at the head of the first pool was a trickle of a spring. It bubbled out of the gravel, delivering clear cold water into a slow deep stretch. A dribble like that wouldn't make much difference to the entire flow of the Genesee River, but since the side channel carried less than half of the cubic feet per second, it could be cooled enough for the trout to survive through the hottest summers. Fish at Stevens Court were predictably present, plump, and happy. Just knowing about Stevens Court stretch of the Genesee River made you a de facto member of the most secretive, exclusive fly fishing clubs of that time. The day that John Miller first brought me there, he said in his most serious voice, you are not to tell anybody about this place. He then went on to name specific guys that I wasn't to tell, like Mark, who liked to talk so much that he wouldn't keep quiet, or Jay the guide, who would have a pair of paying clients parked there from May till August. The entire time I fished there, I almost never ran into a stranger. Just John, or Merle, or Bob, or Bill. A guy prospecting the river from above or below by foot or kayak would be far more likely to follow the main channel, oblivious that he was sidestepping a fisherman's nirvana. Even if somebody were to make his way down the hallowed half, he might not realize what he was seeing. The water at Stevens Court was calm and the fish spooky, and if you didn't tiptoe through the head-high canary grass on the banks, or wade at a smooth, slow, Tai Chi-like pace, your quarry would dart to an undercut bank or the belly of the pool. You may never see them or know they were there. I kept my word to John Miller for the most part. The few buddies I brought there tended to live far away, so there wasn't much danger of them showing up without me. 
I could pile dozens of individual stories on top of Stephen's court involving explosive mayfly hatches, super selective risers at an evening spinner fall, my discovery of the LaFontaine caddis pupa making impossible fish easy, resident dogs getting in barking matches with mine from across the river, a velvety buck walking past me close enough to pet, a frightened turkey hovering and pooping over the river until he gained enough altitude to scram. You can begin to feel possessive and protective towards public water. That little, not even a quarter mile stretch, just four miles down river, the Wellsville Sewage Treatment Plant was for years a source of anticipation and adventure and camaraderie. Heraclitus said that no man can wade the same river twice. He probably meant that allegorically, but an aerial view of the Genesee shows how true that literally is. Any river is a dynamic environment, constantly rerouting its flow. Slow erosion or a quick diversion brought by a flood will shift a river's course. What the Army Corps of Engineers giveth, Mother Nature can take away. Somewhere around 2006, I came here to discover that an early spring spate had dumped this gravel bar across the inlet to Stevens Court Run, cutting it off almost entirely. The magic waters that birthed our secret society were choked to a trickle you could jump across. Not willing to accept this, I came back here with a shovel and tried to dig the channel open by hand. The fresh gravel was loose and easily dug, but there was just far too much of it. I needed an Irish crew from the Erie Canal days to accomplish what was needed. Mind you, this was a bit of guerrilla engineering. In New York, you need some serious permitting to divert a waterway. To go through the proper channels, I would have had to team with somebody like Trout Unlimited to lobby for the alteration, wait out the necessary environmental reviews, argue in a public forum, it would take years, and success would not be guaranteed. And after all that, if the river was put back to where it was, it would be known to all fishermen far and wide, replete with a midstream ribbon-cutting ceremony in hip boots. So since those days, the Genesee River has changed, and maybe I have too. The insect hatches no longer produce the kind of fluttering clouds that draw swallows and wax wings. Most summers are now too hot and long to hold the trout over into the next year. My visits to the Jenny are way less frequent and less bountiful. They're done as a tribute to times now past. I moved on to boat fishing, first in the Finger Lakes and then in Lake Ontario. I've found tremendous sport in these new places, of a completely different kind. Most lake trollers could never understand the sublime joy of getting a 16-inch brown trout to take a dry fly, or tying a perfect imitation of a stone fly you found on the stream, having it full fish and abiting the next day. The weeds grow tall in the old Stevens Court run. John is gone, Merle is gone, Mark is gone. I turn elsewhere to find sport and adventure, and experience them with different people now. Stevens Court exists in my memory as an example of discovering something that I'd always dreamed about, finding its reality as wonderful as my imagination had supposed. I hope you all should be so lucky.